thank you, Jenny, and also thank you to the Scientific Committee for letting me uh, speak here today. Um, so I'll be talking about sheep, and I'll be talking about using genomics to improve reproduction traits in sheep. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, so in particular, uh, Belorma and uh, Julius and Ben, uh, who's certainly been instrumental in, in, uh, in this research. I'll talk a little bit, uh, have a bit of an intro, uh, intro on reproduction traits, uh, some known mutations that we are aware of, some marker technologies and how they fit together. And then I'll have two examples of analysis. One is uh, genomic prediction with medium and high density SNP chips. And the other is some analysis in the 50K where we looked at lethal recessives in three sheep populations in Australia. And then last little bit, uh, I'll outline one potential strategy that we could use for using sequence data to improve reproduction or just uh, production in general. So sheep reproduction, uh, certainly an important trait, um, but it's not just about having lambs on the ground. They actually have to survive and they have, have to have a you know, reasonable growth, so mothering ability is important. Um, it's hard to improve because it's expressed later in life, so we don't really know, uh, use uh, potential for this, these traits until you know, she's had a few lambs on the ground, and they're usually low heritability. Um, they tend to be composite traits, so they have components of fertility and fecundity and survival and mothering ability and all sorts of things in it, so it's, that makes it hard uh, to improve as well. Um, and there are several large mutations that exist, and so I've, I've tried to list uh, most of them that I'm aware of, and uh, I'm sure I've missed a few, but essentially um, they are uh, in quite a few of our uh, sheep breeds that we're using for production. Um, they are on chromosome 5, 6, 11, and X, um, and so far I think there's three genes that have been indicated to harbor these, and, and the other ones I'm sure they're to come soon. So these increase ovulation rate and litter size and maybe one of the interesting bits about these mutations is that if for some of them if you have them in the homozygous state it actually makes the animal infertile. So that may, complicates then matters if you want to use these in a breeding program. Um, a little bit on the different marker technologies that we have at, at our disposal at, at the moment. So we have if I can bring up the mouse, here we go. So we, we can envision this as a pyramid. We have the low-density chip at the bottom where lots of animals would be, would be uh, chipped with that. Uh, the medium-density chip uh, may be the workhorse for genomic prediction. And then moving on to the more costly technologies uh, at the top for high-density chip and sequencing. So the cost really dictates what gets uh, genotyped on these. So in the bottom, we probably have industry using it on selection candidates, and in the middle it's more uh, research projects that do reference populations, and at the top, again, at this point, research, but because it's so expensive, we can only afford to do key ancestors and maybe some sires and experiments. So what's really attractive, attractive about this uh, setup is, of course, that we could impute from all the way from low density up to eventually, well, who knows, sequence. Um, and then we'd have really large reference populations for our analysis uh, for either GWAS or genomic selection or what have you. And this could then enable uh, the search for causative mutations. And um, the hypothesis is that we could get higher accuracy in more distantly related populations. So in terms of genomic prediction, um, what we tried to do was to combine two sources of information. One is the U records that we have, genotyped use that have good reproduction records or had reproduction records. Um, we wanted to also, though, utilize the sires that had uh, daughters with reproduction records. So we, we combined these two pieces of data, and of course they have um, different accuracies, so we had to account for that in our analysis, and we designed a cross-validation scheme to test the accuracy. So we calculated trait deviations for use and daughter trait deviations for sires for three traits. Uh, one is litter size, one is the number of lambs weaned per ewe joined, 
uh, and the other one is the number of lambs we uh, born per you joined. We had two SNP technologies, one is 50K and one is imputed 600K. Um, we then, uh, in genomic prediction, we weighted them as in Garrick et al., 2009, and we performed GBLOP, and by that I mean a REML with a genomic relationship matrix as calculated uh, in Yang. We imputed 600K, and uh, in 600K, we're currently doing base R, uh, which I don't have any results yet on. So we had a cross-validation scheme. Essentially, we just divided the data up into six parts and then predicted each part by the five other parts and then calcul calculated the accuracy within breed um, as the correlation between GBV and uh, trait deviations or other trait deviations. And we uh, scaled that by the accuracy from BLOP uh, in the U's and, and the sires. What the sires we had uh, the genotype daughters excluded from that analysis to sort of approximate the accuracy we could get in a true breeding value. We did the cross-validation in two different ways. One was just randomly assigned individuals to the subsets, and the other one was uh, we uh, made sure that whole sire families were within the subset. So we weren't predicting within half sib populations. So this is a more restrictive um, or a conservative measure of accuracy, if you will. So it does actually restrict the relationships that we find. We had lots of merino individuals in our population, so that's the blue, the blue part in these circles. And uh, so 70% at least uh, merino, and then border leicester was the next biggest breed, which was 13%. So I'll only be, I'll only be showing results for those two breeds. For the trait deviations, um, we, uh, the input data was 250,000, raw phenotype data was 250,000 records, and from that we estimated heritabilities of between 6 and 8 percent, and a little bit higher rep repeatabilities. We had 3,800 ewes that were genotyped, and we had 330 sires that were genotyped, um, and with daughter records, summarizing about 6,000 on genotype daughters. So we imputed from the 50K to the 600K, and after quality control in the HD, we had about 500,000 SNPs left. We only, at that point, we only had 826 animals with the HD. We now have more, so we'll be repeating this, but they were mainly Merino, Polk, Dorset, Border Leicester, White Suffolk, and Texel, um, and then we imputed into the multi-breed reference. The, the Beagle R squares are in the in the 0.8 range to close to 0.9, which is a bit lower than we, we've seen in the beef and uh, in dairy. So I think there's room for improvement in our imputation. So these are some of the results. So first, um, this is uh, showing means across the three, diff the three traits. And I'm, I really only want to sort of emphasize the trends. So we had also done a blob and we try to predict with BLOP. So the first thing I'd like you to notice is that we get an increase um, in accuracy from BLOP to GBLOP, mainly when we restrict relationships in our cross-validation. So here we have BLOP, and yes, they're all pretty low accuracies. I am, am, am aware of that. But um, so there is an increase when we use GBLOP, and, um, but less so, I think, in when we do a random cross-validation. So in the random cross-validation, um, even from pedigree, when you're predicting one half sip from another half sip, you actually do not too badly. The other trend I'd like you to see is that uh, with the sire family cross-validation, we have lower accuracies than with the random cross-validation, and that's just, again, due to restricting relationships. Um, the third thing I'd like you to notice is here we have a slight uptick uh, in accuracy from the 600K, so there's a slight increase, um, and hopefully that might increase a bit more when we have a, a more accurate imputation uh, with the larger set that we're about to do. And here we have the accuracies for the different traits separated out. Um, 
they are for the merino they are lowest for um, the litter size trait and for the border lester they are lowest for the number of lambs wean trait there is a larger uh, increase slightly larger increase uh, in the sire family cross validations from the 600k um, you could maybe read into this that um, in less related individuals you get a slightly more of a benefit from a denser chip um, but again of course uh, here we have random cross validation has overall a higher level of accuracy than when we restrict relationship with the sire families so GBLOP had higher accuracies than BLOP uh, there was a small increase with the 600k and Essentially, what these results uh, tell me is that we need larger reference populations and probably the best way to get it is with uh, genotyping more sires in, the po in our populations that have daughters with reproduction records. So the second uh, set of analysis I'd like to talk about is the identification of haplotypes that have lethal or putative lethal recessive mutations. So these mutations arise, or any mutations, of course, arise by chance, and some of them just happen to be deleterious. Uh, they may increase in frequency due to drift, and they may also be incre uh, may increase in frequency due to linkage with uh, production trait. But they don't occur in the homozygous state. So we tried to exploit this property, and uh, we identified putative lethal mutations by searching for haplotypes that never occur as homozygotes in our populations. We phased all our 50K genotypes, and we had about 24,000 at the time with our in-house program, chromophase, and these were individuals from the sheep CRC and from industry. We identified and assigned uh, all unique, or assigned consecutive uh, identifiers to all unique haplotypes in our population across all breeds and um, we counted haplotypes with missing alleles as, as unique. So we, didn't, we essentially excluded them later on from the analysis. The haplotype lengths we considered were five loci uh, all the way up to a 100 loci. We had three proportions available from, from pedigree, and we, from that we determined our purebreds. They had to be more than 0.95 of a certain breed to be considered purebred. This left us with about 9,500 merinos, 760 Pole Dorset, and 330 Border Lesters. We then calculated within breed haplotype frequencies and the expected number of homozygotes based on Hardy Weinberg, and this is essentially what uh, Paul Van Raden and others did in 2011. We looked at inheritance within carrier families once we had found some, and we fitted carrier status to our tra uh, trait deviations in the purebreds to determine whether there's an actual effect on the trait. So these are the potential recessive lethals that we identified. Just a little bit on the nomenclature over here. So haplotype name, we have the breed. So BL is for water lester. The second number is the the chromosome and the third number is the number of loci in the haplotype. And the last two numbers you don't need to know. But essentially, um, in the border Leicester, uh, we identified lethal recessives uh, on chromosome 2, 4, 8, 15, and 24. And sometimes haplotypes of different lengths identified the same spot on the genome with recessive lethals. And the frequency of these um, depended a little bit on the breed because well, you only have power to detect so many if you have 300 uh, border lesters but the frequency was uh, in 0.214 to uh, 0.11 so it was about greater than 0.1 let's put it that way based on that we expected uh, about six, six we wanted six or more um, expected homozygotes in the population, but we only, uh, I'm only listing the ones that didn't have any homozygotes at all. In the Paul Dorset, uh, we found two putative recessive lethals on chromosome 13 and 18. 
and the frequency was a little bit lower than in the, in the border Leicester. Um, in the Merino, we found, uh, found uh, positions on chromosome 2, 4, and 9, and because we had many more, um, many more Merino, we actually could identify them even if they were at a little bit lower frequency. So these sort of results coincide a little roughly with the effective population size of these breeds. Uh, border Leicesters have the lowest effective population size and Merino have the largest, so we, we sort of expected to find more within Border Leicester. So then we looked at um, two more things. One is we looked at carrier sire families and within a carrier sire family we have an expected sort of frequency and um, which is basically uh, 0.25 if the sire is heterozygous plus the half the frequency in the population so in the observed ratios were all lower than that um, but we didn't have a whole lot of these sire families per breed and also we didn't have a whole lot of progeny in these so these are only indicative um, but there seems to be a little bit depletion of these alleles in their progeny. The other thing we did was we fitted these, uh, the carrier status to, to the dot trait deviations. And long story short, there's two that, or the one location that came up significant, and that's the, the top two rows there. Um, that is the border Leicester, the one that we found in the border Leicester. So we found 10 positions that were found to uh, have putative lethal mutations. They are present, or seem to be present in all three breeds. The best evidence is in our border Leicester population, but we do need to do further work to confirm. We, there's, I've seen quite a lot of people look at the intensity plots from the genotypes uh, to see whether we've missed some homozygotes. This is of interest mainly to the purebred breeder and uh, maybe the multipliers, but if you're crossbreeding, um, at this point, we can't say that there is an issue because we haven't actually found any that go across breed. And eventually, we could uh, find these in the sequence data. So what are some potential strategies for the future? Um, well, certainly, we need to increase our reference population sizes with more industry sires, pr primarily, to increase our accuracies. But we could also use the, the high-density chip and whole genome sequence to apply genomic selection, find map and identify causative embryonic lethal mutations, and also identify other non-lethal mut recessive mutations. And also, we could identify QTL and causative mutations for major traits, including reproduction. But if we're going to really high density, it's really unlikely that genetic evaluation will be using millions of SNPs. I think that's unrealistic. So what could we do? We, and Many other speakers at this Congress and Mike, Mike Goddard and Ben Hayes and others have suggested this before, is to mine the next generation sequence data to prioritize SNPs for genotyping. So we could find causative variants, we could prioritize by, based on coding genomic regions, we could identify regions expressed from RNA-seq, we could look at um, some epigenetics or regulatory regions from CHIP-seq, we could support these data from metabolomic studies. We could even look, if we are a bit cash strapped in sheep, we could look in the dairy data if they have uh, RNA seq on fertility and maybe prioritize regions based on that. But also, of course, we need to look at basically just statistically and identify SNPs with large effects or medium effects to include in this prioritized set. Eventually, then we would develop low-density assay, assays and that maximize imputation and impute this prioritized set and do genomic prediction on that reduced set. So we've, we have, essentially we're doing just that. We have a new project in the sheep CRC um, where we're sequencing 500 sheep key ancestors and uh, we intend to impute sequence genotypes into animals genotyped at lower density uh, we'll do GWAS for many phenotypes and we'll be investigating genomic selection in this context. We also have a large project at DEPI uh, where we're sequencing uh, RNA sequence 
on 150 lambs of, uh, for liver and muscle tissue at slaughter. And here we're interested in which regions are expressed um, or whether we find some allele-specific expression. Last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the various funding bodies and, uh, and consortia and the many people that have had valuable input into this study and have worked on some of the analysis. And again, I'd like to flog our conference in, uh, in Australia. So it is next year, so we have lots of time, you know, and it's a beautiful place to visit and we'd love to have you. Thank you. Yeah, so from the length, you should be able to determine the age. And I think in the abstract, I do mention guesses around that. But um, so a crossbreed, you would expect only the short ones, uh, the short haplotypes to actually go across breed because they would have been pre, pre-divergence or if there's some admixtures, you might, uh, you might see them going across breed because of that, I guess. But... Uh, but maybe with the high density chip, we can maybe have a bit more power when we go a little bit shorter. Yeah. Hutton. That's a good word, uh, What proportion of the mortalities that occur between birth and weaning do you think is due to these lethal recessions? Or is it it's the so, zero? Well, yeah, so um, because we can't actually. So it seemed to be more correlated with litter size than with the other traits. So this seems indicative that it's actually gestation when when this seems to happen, when these have an effect. But uh, uh, I think these are, if they never occur, I think these are embryonic. Well, I guess if they occur after genotyping or before genotyping, I guess that's the the key thing. So I don't know what the proportion is, quite frankly. Pardon me? With the animals that were They would have been included. So they, they were included. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you.